Victor Institute. He will tell us about complexity and almost <laughs> Okay, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to join the chorus of the other speakers in uh, thanking the organizers for this wonderful meeting and bringing us all together here in a, in a marvelous location. It's, it's a pleasure to be back in Sao Paulo after many years or several years. Um, well, there's my title, Complexity Equals Almost Anything. Um, it refers to, or there's some recent work, some recent papers. Um, and I want to point out, though, that I have some very smart collaborators who've co uh, contributed uh, and without whom I could not be uh, standing here today talking about this topic. In any event, one of the things uh, that's really come to the fore in the past decade um, when we think about holography is the intersection with quantum information theory. And there have been all sorts of interesting developments there. And, and in my talk is in that, uh, sort of fits under that umbrella. But I wanted to say that, you know, the story really starts way back in 2006 with our friends Rue and Takianagi. And they were thinking about uh, entanglement entropy in the context of ADS CFT. And so, we start by asking a question in the boundary conformal field theory. That's, that blue slice is a time slice. And what we're doing is we're dividing that time slice into two pieces, A and A complement. And then we're asking, uh, or we can produce the reduced density matrix describing the degrees of freedom in A. And we'd like to know the entanglement entropy because the condensed matter theorists or the quantum information theorists told, it was an in, told us it was an interesting thing to do. So we calculate minus trace rho log rho. Um, or in principle, we could try and do that. that even in the simplest uh, quantum field theories, in the simplest geometries, that's a very challenging problem. And so what our friends Ru and Takinagi did is they used holography to change that or translate that problem in the boundary theory into this nice geometric uh, problem in the boundary or in the bulk. And so there what I'm doing is I'm considering all of the surfaces that hang down into the bulk, which end on this surface sigma, which is dividing between our two regions in the boundary, and I'm evaluating the Bekenstein-Hawking formula on those surfaces. I extremize them, or I find the surface that gives me the minimal area, and then uh, I, that area, or that Bekenstein and Hawking formula, gives me the entanglement entropy. And there were, well, that was somewhat of a surprise, and there were all sorts of tests, and it took many, many years, or it took uh, at least six years before this uh, formula was proven in the simplest case. Um, but it really became an interesting framework um, where I say there was a, a fruitful forum or, or there was a fruitful dialogue between both sides of uh, the duality. You know, we learned new lessons about entanglement entropy and strongly coupled field theories. But we also started to learn about the properties of quantum gravity. There's this whole story that we may know about of quantum error correction and how information is distributed uh, in the uh, theory or in quantum gravity. Um, and one of the things that emerged was this slogan that space-time geometry equals entanglement. And that's really just expressing the idea that the entanglement of the microscopic degrees of freedom were essential or are an essential ingredient in producing this nice smooth space-time in the bulk theory. So it was a little bit disconcerting when a few years later, my slide, oh, there they are, uh, when Lenny Suskin wrote a paper saying entanglement is not enough, what he really meant that was that entanglement entropy was not enough. Entanglement entropy, as I described it, is one diagnostic of this entanglement that I was talking about, but it's not the only diagnostic. And what he was really urging us to do was to think about other diagnostics uh, that would probe the entanglement, 
In particular, he was interested in getting access to the physics inside of black holes. Um, and, well, he made the argument actually relying on uh, papers by Maldacena and Hartman to argue that entanglement entropy would not be a sufficient diagnostic. So here, I've, I've somewhat glibly shown, we now know what a black hole looks like, thanks to the work of the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, today, all you're going to get are pictures like this, our standard ADS black hole. So there's the singularities uh, at the top and the bottom, and then an Einstein-Rosen bridge connecting two asymptotic uh, boundary regions. And of course, this is uh, dual in the boundary theory to the thermofield double um, uh, state, as I've shown in that formula. And what Lenny, uh, well, part of what Lenny was saying was that, or part of his discussion was that entanglement entropy is, in fact, a very robust uh, diagnostic or quantity that we calculate because if I have the reduced density matrix, it only relies on, or it only gives us information about the eigenvalues of that reduced density matrix. And his uh, thought was that we needed new diagnostics that would be more sensitive to the structure, the full structure of the density matrix, including perhaps uh, phases that we find in, uh, in various elements. And so he had the suggestion that what we should think about is a new quantity called complexity. And I put a question mark there simply because I think this is an idea that hasn't have filtered out into the community as widely as entanglement entropy has. So I should say a few words about what complexity is. Well, it is uh, what it sounds like. It's how difficult is it to implement a task. And in particular, for today's talk, we're going to be considering the task of preparing a particular state, a state in the boundary theory. And so the way we're going to evaluate the complexity, or we imagine evaluating the complexity, we borrow again from the quantum information uh, theorists, and we're going to use a uh, circuit model. So on the right-hand side, I have psi naught. That's some reference state. So for example, if I have a bunch of qubits, I might think of the simple state where they're all just uh, spin down. Then I have my target state on the left, and I want to build a unitary that's going to take me from my reference state to my target state. And, well, there's always going to be a unitary that's transforming between these states in the Hilbert space, but I'm going to assign myself the task of building that unitary from a simple set of gates that only, or these are small unitaries that only act on a few of the qubits at any given time. And so I pick a certain set of gates, and then I put them together, yep, put them together uh, to form a circuit. And then what I'm supposed to imagine is that I can, uh, well, if I actually do that, it may be very difficult to get precisely to the target state that I want. And so I may introduce a tolerance like that, so that if I get my state within some epsilon by a measure, I'm, I'm satisfied and I, I stop building the circuit there. But I imagine now that I'm uh, able to look at all possible circuits that are going to accomplish this task and I find the smallest one, or the optimal circuit, and then I simply count up the number of gates in that circuit. And this minimum number of gates, then, is the complexity. And oh, you knew the other ones. I'm impressed. <laughs> Sorry, which... Uh, Oh, yeah, okay. So, so you caught me. That's the first time in many years. So this is not actually working for uh, pure states. This is something you do if you're, you're working with uh, um, mixed states. So there what you would do is you would in introduce uh, ancillary degrees of freedom, act with a unitary, and then you take out the extra degrees of freedom. 
Um, it, it really depends on uh, the system that we're working with. You know, if I'm an experimentalist in the lab, I can probably only accomplish a limited set of tasks. The, the question is, you know, what is a uh, universal gate set? You know, can I really get from any state to any other state with a fixed set of uh, gates? And so that's something that one has to study. Um, and, and there are, well, there are, you know, there are many different possibilities. It depends what the rules are, what the degrees of freedom are, how many degrees of freedom I'm allowed to touch at any given time. I, it could be zero, and in fact, <laughs> uh, this is far more detailed than I was going to talk about this, but in, in, in the models that we think about, or that we think may be relevant for quantum field theories, we're not actually using discrete gates. We're using something. Uh, uh, well, we you you model it with a, a continuous system, and in, it turns out in that case that the the uh, tolerance is not really uh, needed at all at, at that point. And and that's in some sense why in this talk the tolerance never appears, uh, or not necessarily in this talk, but if I was giving other talks on complexity. Um, I, you mean without the tolerance or with the tolerance? No, I think that, well, I think that the issue is that if you want to hit precisely and you have discrete gates acting on discrete qubits, um, typically yeah, you would need an infinite number of steps. And that's why we introduce the tolerance to avoid that. Uh, in the, in this, in the, in, in sort of using this, structure of Nielsen geometry and you have these continuous gates, at some level what you're doing is you're applying these gates or these unitaries with arbitrary powers and that gives you more precision to move around more uh, delicately in the, in the state space. Um, this is <laughs> these are all great questions. Uh, this is quantum mechanics, and uh, something that I'm not going to tell you is I'm going to I'm going to give you all sorts of observables, and if I evaluate them, they diverge. There's a UV divergence, and so the first thing you have to do in your field theory is you have to put in a UV regulator to really make sense of it, just as we did for entanglement entropy. And so, in, in the simplest cases, you're basically taking your continuum field theory and reducing it down to a quantum mechanics problem, or that's one way of thinking of it. That's an ah, great question. Is the answer going to depend on the choices? Like I said, uh, there's a reference state, there's a set of gates, there's a tolerance. And the answer is yes, it does depend. Um, and that's really at the heart of uh, the discussion here today. Um, so this is some introductory comments on what complexity or quantum complexity is. Um, Lenny went far beyond that, of course. He wanted to apply this or think about this in the context of holography. And so he made some suggestions on how we might measure the complexity in the boundary theory. The first one here is complexity equals volume. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking a time slice in the boundary theory, and I'm imagining I'm evaluating some quantity, the complexity associated with the state defined on that time slice. And this looks very much like the Ru Takunagi formula in that I take a Cauchy surface, or, or surfaces that could serve as a Cauchy surface. It's a space-like co-dimension one surface in the bulk. I vary, uh, or I evaluate the volume of that surface. I vary over all of them, and in this case, I find the, one, the, surfa the extremal surface that gives me the maximum volume. 
Um, alternatively, he later proposed with another set of collaborators, complexity equals action. There I take a particular region of the bulk space-time, and you could think of it as the domain of, domain of dependence of one of these uh, extremal surfaces or a, a Cauchy surface joining my, my time slices in the boundary. And given that region, what I'm told I should do is I should evaluate the gravitational or the supergravity action on that surface or on that region. And again, that uh, quantity um, up to some normalization that they picked uh, is giving a me or is proposed to give a measure of the uh, complexity. One thing that you can note that was really motivating uh, Lenny and his collaborators is that the these um, quantities or these geometric objects are probing the interior of the black hole. And they do so at late times, which means if I push my uh, time slices up on the boundary theory towards the top, they always are probing the interior of the black hole. In passing, I'll, I'll also note that our friends in Texas uh, came up with a simple proposal as well you have the Wheeler-DeWitt patch, rather than taking, uh, you know, evaluating something as complicated as the gravitational action, they suggested just take the volume of that region, and that could also be a measure of complexity. So these are, you know, very interesting. They're a new class of gravitational observables that you might think about um, in ADS-CFT, but why should I think that it's something to do with complexity? And so I'll give two qualitative arguments, which are really Lenny's arguments, or Lenny and collaborators, on why I should think the behavior of these uh, gravitational observables is, actually corresponds to something that I should think of as complexity in the boundary theory. The first is um, linear growth. So the idea is here, um, that I have uh, a system, uh, the boundary theory, with a very large number of degrees of freedom, that the spectrum is dense and chaotic, um, then I can think of the evolution of that state as I'm throwing gates, namely little, uh, you know, trotteri, or, or small gates corresponding to time evolution or small uh, unitaries corresponding to uh, e to the iht for some small region at the state. And these gates, in general, are just going to create uh, more and more complications or, or interesting developments. It's very rare that if I, I, I come later and I throw another gate on the same set of degrees of freedom that there's some kind of cancellation which would make the state simpler. And so the argument was that, that you should expect that the complexity in, for this particular class of systems should grow um, for a very long time. Now, what should the rate or the slope be proportional to? Well, it should be proportional to the number of degrees of freedom. A proxy for that is the black hole entropy. It's really telling us about the relevant number of degrees of freedom. Um, and it's a rate, uh, it's something changing per time, and so I need to make up the dimensions with something, and so the temperature is a useful, um, or, or a, a readily access, or it's, it's a scale in the problem that, that seems to play that role. And if I then put those together, it's the entropy times the temperature, but for a conformal field theory, that's none other than the mass or the energy of the system. And that's precisely what is seen in these holographic formulas that I was showing you on the previous transparency. Um, one thing here is that there's a much more elaborate story about um, how after, if I have uh, a finite Hilbert space, that eventually I will explore the entire phase space and that the complexity plateaus and there's uh, all of that. But we're just focused today on uh, that rising time. Um, we're not in our geometric uh, framework going to be able to see any of this other structure. Although I'll, I'll point your attention to this interesting paper by these folks where uh, 
They were working in JT gravity and including wormholes or topology change, and they argued that they could see this saturation that appears there. So that was uh, one idea, the linear growth, um, where the growth is proportional to the mass, and you can see that the coefficients aren't quite the same, but both of these uh, satisfy or uh, provide that uh, property. The next is the switchback effect. So here what we're doing is we're considering a, our thermophile double, double state, uh, but we're going to perturb it uh, by these operators, W at T1, T2, T3, Tn. Usually I would think of those being in a time order, that T1 is first, T2 second, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, we do it in an alternating or a zigzag order. So if T1, uh, if I start at T1, I go forward to T2, but then I come backwards in time to T3 and forward and, and vice versa. Um, and what that uh, results in is a complexity growth that looks something like this. First, there's a term that's linear at, with the time evolution, and that's what I was saying before. But then there's a shift or a delay um, that's proportional to a particular constant named, called the scrambling time. And this happens every time my path folds either uh, back and forth, so at each one of these uh, operator times. And so what I want to think about or tell you about is, is let's focus our attention on one of these folds. Let's focus our attention on T3. And we'll think about what happens when I have the perturbation there or when I don't have the perturbation there. And so let's start by taking out the perturbation. Well, essentially, um, I mean, it's really obvious here, although I'm going to draw lots of uh, pictures, that the EDIH T3 is going to cancel the EDIH minus T3. And so there's no increase in complexity uh, associated with dragging the path down there because there, nothing really happened there. And so if I draw that, uh, if I tell that story in terms of uh, qubits and gates, I can imagine this is some small set of qubits in my large n squared number of degrees of freedom. Um, I'm starting with evolving backwards to T3 with EDIH T3. I can do that in a discrete way I, um, where I have small unitaries acting on pairs of qubits or pairs of degrees of freedom, and that carries me back to the time T3. At that point, I want to go forward again. I'm applying E to the IH, E to the minus IH T, and so there's another set of gates then that carry me forward or up in the diagram. Now I've distinguished the two gates because in one case I'm going backwards, in the other case I'm going forwards, and so these gates are actually inverses of one another. And so if we think about the inner layer there, I've got a unitary, a, uh, a brown unitary, and it's followed by its inverse, the green. And so what happens? Well, those gates cancel out. And similarly with the next layer and the next layer. And so again, there's no gates left over. There are these precise cancellations, and there's no increase in the complexity. So what happens now if I add the perturbation? Well, almost the same thing happened. At the top of the diagram, there's going to be a cancellation. But as long as my perturbation only touches a few qubits around the point where that's inserted in the diagram, those gates aren't going to be able to cancel anymore because there's a complication set in the circuit there. And similarly, in the next layer, many of the gates cancel out but some of them are left over. And so the dis disturbance spreads out through the system. This is what people refer to as scrambling, or, or in, these, in, these, uh, in these chaotic, or in these boundary theories, that would be the scrambling. And so its influence spreads out over the system, but for a long time there is a partial cancellation, 
Um, and that's what the scrambling time is indicating. That even when I stick the perturbation in, as long as it's a small perturbation, there's a partial cancellation. And so the, the, every time there's a fold, the complexity, uh, there's a delay in the growth of the complexity. And in fact, you can reproduce this result where our perturbations now become shock waves that are perturbing or disturbing the black hole space time, and you get precisely uh, this behavior. And so that was, both of these are qualitative arguments, again, that say that these new gravitational observables are behaving in a way that we might expect complexity of the boundary state to behave in. Um, but there's still this, there, there's no underlying derivation like the lukowitz maldacena derivation of entanglement entropy. And so one is asked, you know, wh 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 why do I have three different choices? And why is it volume? You know, it's a very discrete set of choices that we have here. And there were some discussions that perhaps the, uh, you know, the ability to make different choices here is related to the idea that the underlying microscopic model of complexity had these ambiguities and I was making choices to come up with different complexity models. So it was again the reference state, gate set, something that I didn't talk about, but you might want to weight different gates differently when you're, uh, especially if I'm an experimentalist, it may be harder to do some things than to do others. Um, and so that was in part our motivation, uh, or with hindsight, it becomes a motivation for what we did. And so let's take a look at the first example. This was Lenny's complexity equals volume. And this was the formula. I was taking Cauchy surfaces or Cauchy slices, evaluating a volume, extremizing it, and then uh, evaluating the volume on the extremal surface. And as I described it, it was, there were really two things happening. First, there was this extremization procedure, which picked out a special surface. And then it was really, I evaluate a particular quantity, the volume of that surface, and that's what I assign to the complexity. And, well, one of the observations is, in that, from that perspective, what I'm doing is I'm building some nice diffeomorphism invariant observable. But with that two-step process in mind, it's very easy to generalize the idea. So I'm again considering these Cauchy surfaces, but rather than you know, integrating the number one across that surface to get one, uh, to get the volume, I'm going to stick in some geometric functional. So it could depend on the background metric or the embeddings, namely it could involve curvatures like the Riemann squared, or it could involve extrinsic curvatures like the trace of the extrinsic curvature. So, so I could stick in some interesting functional there. Then I extremize with regards to the precise embedding that I choose for the surface, namely I move the surface around and I find the optimal uh, uh, surface as it stretches across. That's picking out um, a special surface. Now I want to evaluate some geometric feature of that surface, and I do it in more or less the same way, but I'm highlighting here by having a different in index on my functional that I don't have to evaluate exactly the same thing that I use to extremize in the first step. And so that gives me an observable it's a nice diffeomorphism invariant observable, but at this point we can ask, so what? And the so what is that you can go back and you can ask, well, you know, there were these two properties, late time, linear late time growth and the switchback effect, and you can test these observables, these new observables, and what you find is that for a huge class of such observables, you in fact get uh, late uh, linear time growth or growth of the complexity with time and that the coefficient is proportional to the mass and you also uh, can show that uh, the shock waves have the same property of introducing uh, the switchback effect. And so what that indicates is you have now a huge family of observables uh, 
which sort of display a universal behavior. And so any one of them seems like an equally viable uh, candidate for holographic complexity. Now at this point in the talk, I usually go through all sorts of calculations to indicate, you know, to give you an example, to show you how this works, and, and to assure you that you, you really produce those answers. But this slide is just here to remind me to tell you that that's not what I'm going to do today. There's not enough time, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely not enough time. Um, in any event, well, I'll, I'll just make the, the one comment that we do the trick that we always do, which is reduce our complicated problem down to a simple classical mechanics problem. And then you can borrow all of your intuition from classical mechanics to understand the behavior of these surfaces. Instead, what I'm going to jump ahead to is, well, what about these other um, complexity equals action or complexity equals space-time volume? You know, is there a generalization of those? In this case, it didn't really seem that there was any extremization procedure. We were just told Wheeler-DeWitt patch, that's interesting. Let's evaluate properties of that. And so here, just as a leap of faith perhaps, I'm just going to say, well, if I want to build interesting um, observables uh, that are diffeomorphism invariant, I can follow more or less the same procedure. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say I have some region M, or a class of regions M, and they're bounded uh, uh, by a future surface sigma plus and a past surface sigma minus. I set up some functional, and it can have a bulk term where I'm integrating some geometric stuff over M. It can have boundary terms where I'm integrating over the top surface and the bottom surface. And then what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to extremize over the, or what I, the proposal is, I extremize over the positions of those two surfaces. Um, and that's then picking out special bounding surfaces and a particular uh, region in my space time. And then I follow the same second step, which is that I I've got a special region with certain boundaries. I evaluate some geometric stuff on all of that. And that gives me a nice diffeomorphism invariant uh, observable or a class of observables. But again, if I work harder, I can show that I get this linear late time growth and I get the switchback effect. So again, I have a huge class of observables that all seem to be good candidates for holographic complexity. Now in this case, I'm going to take a look at a particularly simple example of this, which is that I'm going to, well, I'm going to extremize uh, a quantity which is just the volume over my bulk region and the volume of the two boundary surfaces, but I'm going to weight uh, the latter two by some coefficients just to distinguish all the different surfaces. And it turns out that has a very beautiful geometric, uh, or the equations of motion have a very uh, beautiful geometric interpretation, namely the trace of the extrinsic curvature on the, the past and future surfaces are just constant. And they depend on these parameters, uh, alpha plus and alpha minus, that I stuck up there. Now, the thing that we might observe is that, well, if I took the alphas to zero, those extrinsic curvatures would diverge. So what does that really mean? Well, it means that I actually, as alpha becomes smaller, I'm pushing that top surface as far as it can go in the future. And similarly, I'm pushing the past surface as far as it can go into the past. And so what they become are light sheets in the future, they run into the singularity, but in the past, they're just light sheets that come down and intersect. And I've precisely then reproduced the Wheeler-DeWitt patch. So in this limit of the alphas go to zero, I get back the Wheeler-DeWitt patch as my special region. And so I could evaluate the action there. That would give me complexity equals action. Or in fact, I could evaluate this 
Uh, same observable, where now the alphas have gone to zero, and that gives me complexity equals space-time volume. And so it takes these two ANSATs, or these proposals that were made, and it puts them all within this uh, large framework. Um, if I if I if I go back here or or just yeah it, well again it's I have to work harder I'm shooting in a shock wave um, you know a trick that I didn't tell you is in in uh, when I'm actually evaluating uh, all of this these extremizations and whatnot. Uh, basically, what you do is you integrate by parts the bulk term, and you turn it into two boundary terms. And so then it's it's not hard to imagine, perhaps, that you know most of the analysis is just the analysis that I had before, but I'm doing it twice: once for the future surface, and once for the past surface. And so similarly, when I'm doing the switchback effect, I'm throwing shock waves in, and they're cutting through these surfaces, and and you you pick up the same uh I yeah no I have to I have to take my ansatz and I I test it in a background where I have a shock wave no that's that's really what's producing uh the the switchback effect uh in any event I had the Wheeler wit patch um I'm probably running out of time but I want to do one funny thing which is I'm going to think about alpha plus being very, very small. I'm not quite going to go to zero because what I'm doing then is I'm pushing the surface up near the singularity. And so I'm probing the geometry or the black hole near the singularity. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm only going to focus my attention on that surface by in this uh, procedure that I had. I'm only the functionals in the bulk and on the past surface when I evaluate, I'm just going to set them to zero and I'm going to pick interesting geometry geometric quantities that I can evaluate on that future surface. Um, and so we can look at uh, our short chill, our favorite short chill black hole. You know, basically the surface gets hung up just before the singularity. There's a, a particular surface there, and most of the physics has to do then with that particular surface. I can evaluate different things. For example, if I just evaluate one, the volume of that surface, it's going to zero. And that's because the, uh, the geometry of the, of the transverse space shrinks to zero when you hit the singularity. And that's, that's why there's a singularity there. Um, if I choose the trace of the extrinsic curvature, you just get a constant. If I trace or I take the uh, vial tensor squared, I get some uh, well, interesting prefactor. I get the mass again. But now I get a factor that uh, is proportional to the inverse of alpha plus. And so that's diverging as alpha plus goes to 0. But that's, again, a reflection. And you can make it more precise that the curvature as you approach the singularity is diverging. One of the things you note here is that all three of these have this prefactor, or, or basically governed by the mass, up to dimensionless factors. And the alpha dependence, though, is really allowing us, or it's telling us something interesting about the geometry. Just for comparison, we can look at a charged black hole. In that case, I've got an, an uh, outer and an inner horizon. The Cauchy surfaces aren't going to get past the inner horizon. It's also known as a Cauchy horizon for that region reason. Um, but I'm going to go through the same procedure, and now the, the surfaces get hung up just uh, outside the inner horizon. Um, and I can evaluate the same quantities. Um, in the first case, well, actually, let me, let me point to in the, when I was working in the previous case, we had a factor of m, which was equal to the entropy times the temperature of the black hole. In this case, you find an entropy times a temperature, but it turns out that it's the entropy and temperature of that inner horizon, which makes sense uh, geometrically. 
what the precise physics is, I can't uh, really say at this point. But again, what you see in contrast, uh, well, in parallel to what we saw before, is that the measure is going to zero there. So the, when I evaluate the volume, it goes to zero. The extrinsic curvature gives me a constant. The, uh, uh, the vial tensor, or the curvature, is not doing anything dramatic at the inner horizon, the, me the volume measure is going to zero, and so this uh, last observable is also going to zero there. And so that's saying that we're not reaching uh, a singularity there. Um, so this is just a slide with some conclusions. I guess the basic ideas that I want to convey is that you know, we had these very beautiful proposals of Lenny and collaborators for what holographic complexity might be. What my collaborators and I have shown is that those are just isolated cases of a much broader class of interesting gravitational observables. They all seem to behave uh, like complexity. Um, but the main question is the second blue one, which is, well, now we have this marvelous uh, set of gravitational observables, but how do we really interpret those in the duality or in terms of the boundary theory quantities? So there's really lots to describe or to, lots to explore, and I'll just thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very nice talk. Are there any questions? What was the reference state? So the final state is the black hole. What's the starting state? It's a great question. <laughs> um, no, no, no I, I, we, uh, you don't really see the reference state. And so you're filling in the space time. You know, different people have different conjectures, but, but I can't point to you and say that's the reference state uh, in the boundary theory. Um, Uh, you, you, it makes sense to ask in either context. In the bulk, what people uh, you know, will talk about is, well, I have these quantum degrees of freedom. They're not entangled, and so they're not forming a space-time. And so it's some kind of, uh, well, primordial quantum gravity state where I haven't produced a space-time yet. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I, so what I'm evaluating is the property of a particular state. And so I have all of my boundary states. I can move them up and down and, and evolve them in time and compare different uh, complexities or uh, complexities of different states. But it doesn't help me get to the reference state. Like I'm not unraveling as I evolve backwards in time or forward in time, I'm not going to be unraveling the, com the gates that I needed to prepare that particular state. Does that make sense? Or it, it is, and so you, you, you could ask a question which I'm not asking, which is, well, given a particular you know, simple state, like the vacuum of ADS space, how difficult is it to get to, um, well, some type of evolved state or some excited state where I've, I've thrown in some shock waves or gravitons or whatever. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm just, you know, for example, in empty ADS, I can just take a time slice and I can ask, what's the complexity of the or the CFT vacuum. And what Pedro's asking for is, well, what reference, if, if I'm in the vacuum, where did I start? And it's really, I, well, our, ex our experience with just working with simple quantum field theory, namely free quantum field theories, is the reference state you start with is one where all of the degrees of freedom are disentangled. Um, so it's a very un it's it's not a regular quantum it's not a state you would re usually think about in the quantum field theory. Yeah, uh, so in, in the examples you show, it looked like there was one distinguished one, the one with the extensive curvature. 
is, is this, would you agree with this? Because that gives a finite answer. It's um, proportional to the mass, and then on dimensional grounds, you would expect it to be finite. Um, linear growth as well. The other ones either go to zero or to infinity. Yeah, well, okay. It, it is a distinguished one. I don't know that I can't find examples of other space times where, where it might diverge or go to zero. But I think one of the messages I'd like to say is that having lots of possibilities, um, oh, wrong way. Uh, having lots of possibilities is not a handicap. It's really by comparing all these different uh, observables in the family that you're really being able to distinguish different features of the interior geometry. I think it's probably that's the only finite one based on diffeomorphism invariance and the dimension of, uh, of the object that you want. You want something with linear growth, so I should also want something that depends on the state rather than on the, 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 the normalizable mode, so then the, the mass and, the, and that specific one seems to be distinguished. Uh, yeah, um, depending on the matter fields, though, I know that you can make uh, this quantity either diverge or going to zero, and it really, it no, it diverges, it, it depends on the properties of the stress tensor uh, near the singularity on getting this uh, quantity. I'm, I'm looking at... Here, a vacuum state, in the other case, a particularly simple state or, or simple configuration with a Maxwell field. But you can, well, in principle, you can imagine situations where it diverges. Um, that was hidden in an appendix. In, so, the, yeah. um, so, just as a comment on your very last slide about the lots of things to explore. Um, well, I think it's fair to mention that there's quite a lot of developments on the field theory side. I mean, there's also ideas of constructing gates uh, by uh, the duals of gates by realizing the, the conformal transformations in the, in the dual gravity. And also another development is the Krilov complexity, which is something where you can define complexity without defining a reference state. That, that might also be very helpful in this context. So, I mean, you know, there's lots of things. I mean. No, no, I, I, I did not give a complete yeah. uh, expose. I, I, I would say, though, you know, one of the things people are doing is they're exploring different possibilities. And so, you know, in particular, the first example that you're talking about, what, what you're really asking is a different question there. You're asking the one that I mentioned, where you start with a particular known state, you evolve it to some other state, and you're asking for the complexity of that transition as opposed to building it out of nothing to, to build it. So, so it is, a, in, in some, well, I'll just, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the, does the linear time growth of complexity also holds for DC trace space? I beg your pardon? Uh, for DC trace space. Um, You, uh, you would expect, or it has been proposed, that in De Sitter space, uh, that, uh, that you should find uh, linear growth there. If you look at the gravitational observables, though, in fact, what you see is that the observables diverge because they wander off to time like infinity. Mm -hmm. um, you can mock up the, the linear growth by introducing a cutoff surface. But I think what you really have to do is think more carefully about the quantum gravity theory in a way, well, perhaps that was one of the things Juan was telling us, that cosmology is a much more, ta or de Sitter space is a much more challenging framework than the black holes. Uh, and I, I think that a calculation along the lines of the one that I, I, I mentioned just briefly in JT gravity, where you're taking into account uh, new topologies, that, that you would really need that, all of that apparatus to see the linear time growth uh, in De Sitter, in a De Sitter context. OK, I have one more question. Uh, in this proposal, uh, there is a function f4. Uh, it's f uh, in one case, you have taken this as 1, and in that case, you have taken it as uh, extrinsic curvature, and then um, this wild tensor. Uh, 
So how uh, one can decide whether I should take uh, one or k or c square? So so I, uh, oh. so again, I'm I'm going to say I don't want to pick between the two or between the three. I I want to use all three of them because by by comparing them, I'm I'm going to start mapping out what the properties of the geometry really are. You know, if I just picked uh, extrinsic curvature, you know, I, I would get a constant. It'd be one constant for this black hole, another constant for that black hole. But, you know, for example, I wouldn't see that the, I'm, not, uh, I'm not running into a singularity for this black hole, but I am running into a singularity for the other black hole. So I, I really want to think <laughs> that having this slate of possibilities is, is actually a feature, not a bug. Um, but I think the real question that you want to ask is, you know, well, okay, we have these beautiful gravitational observables. How do I interpret them, or what are they really doing telling me about the boundary theory? Um, okay, one last question. Okay, um, thanks for the talk, and I beg your pardon for my extremely naive question, but uh, so I kind of... Maybe you already said that and I got lost in all these definitions, but uh, it's still not clear to me uh, what you're after by doing all of this, in the sense of I'm not understanding what are the expectations slash hopes uh, that we do have. So what are we trying to learn? And uh, I, I don't know, I just got con very confused. It's just... Uh, it's, it, what are we sure. hoping to no, no, learn that's a good, by, good question. You know, by doing all so, of this? So it's, it's, I have this thermophile double state. I think that it's dual to uh, a black hole. There's all sorts of interesting things that could be happening inside the black hole. You know, the Enterprise could come in from one side, the Klingons from the other. There could be... Um, and so I want to I want to know in the boundary theory, what tools do I have that can tell me about that physics deep inside the black hole, behind the horizon? That's 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 the essential question that let me, or that's what motivated us, or is motivating this program. Are you after a specific? I, I do not know. Like uh, while pursuing this line of research, are you thinking at a specific thing that you'd like to solve? Or uh, it's just a generic uh, idea of we'd like to learn something about the interior of a black hole. I want to say that I want to know whether the Enterprise or the Klingons win, but that's not. Uh, no, it's it's more this general feature of we have these interesting space. It, yeah, it's the general one. We have this interesting space time. How do how does the boundary theory? know about the interior of the black hole. Thank you. Okay, in view of time, I think we should thank Rob again and move on.